And then the fourth commandment, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. God ended his work which he had made and rested on the seventh day and all his work which he had made and he hallowed it. In other words, he wants us to have one day a week set aside for rest and joy and recreation and the worship of God. But we've lost something of the Sabbath and its meaning. Some people went so far and became very legalistic. Some people went so far and just treat it like every other day. We're to have a special day. And then, fifthly, honor thy father and thy mother that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord God giveth thee. You know, till you're about the age of 21 or somewhere along there, I believe that we're to obey our parents and the Lord. After we're full-grown adults and making decisions of our own and families of our own, we're always forever to honor our parents. It doesn't mean that you necessarily agree with them all the time or that you obey them all the time. But you're to honor them. And that's something that we're losing in America. You see, we're, we're living in a period in which they talk about the graying of America. The American people are getting older and older and older. There are less young people and more middle-aged people and older people. And the older people are going to have a big voice in the political scene in America in the next five and ten years. Get ready for the old people. You're not going to have all the emphasis on youth as much as we've had in the last 10 or 12 years because those old people are going to have their Elvises too. I'm going to be one of them. <laughs> Before very long too. Honor thy father and thy mother. And then God gives a promise. If you honor your father and mother that your days may be long upon the earth which the Lord thy God gave you. There's a promise connected with that when you honor your parents. And then sixthly, thou shalt not murder. I'm using the word murder deliberately because there are about 12 or 13 Hebrew words that we translate kill in the Old and the New Testament, and this particular one is premeditated murder. And you know, there's, there's a... I'm not talking about now necessarily just stabbing somebody in the back or shooting somebody or murdering people and we hear of murder by the thousands every year in this country. But you can kill the good name of a person. The psalmist said, they laid to my charge things I knew not. The psalmist said, they take and twist my words and put wrong application. We're not to injure another person's body because that body is sacred in God's sight. And to the Christian, it's the temple of the Holy Spirit. Thou shalt not murder includes all sins which give rise to murder, such as getting angry, losing your temper. You've heard that it was said, by them of old time, Jesus said, Thou shalt not kill, but I say unto you, that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Envy is another. Jealousy. All leads to murder. And that's the reason most murders are really between people of the same family or the same neighborhood. Jealousy. Anger. Murders of passion. You can kill another man's soul by either a bad example or enticing him to sin or by not speaking to him about Christ. God told you to witness to that man, to bring that man to the crusade that he might find Christ and you haven't done it. You're in danger of breaking this commandment. You can become guilty of murdering your own soul by willfully refusing to listen to the Word of God or to respond to Christ's offer of forgiveness or by giving yourself to sinful pleasures instead of Christ. There are many ways we kill, many ways we murder, and we're guilty. Seventhly, thou shalt not commit adultery. This is God's protection 
fence around marriage. Marriage is a sacred covenant. Jesus called his generation an evil and adulterous generation, Matthew 12 to 39. What would he call our generation? One of the signs of the end of the age is the permissive society. Everybody is doing it doesn't mean God is winking at it and God has changed his mind or God's changed his attitude or God has rewritten that commandment. God's going to hold us responsible and Jesus went even further and said if you have lust in your heart toward a person of the other sex you're guilty of breaking this commandment. And then the eighth commandment thou shalt not steal the greatest illustration in the New Testament of a thief was Judas Iscariot. Mary, remember when Mary took a pound of ointment and anointed the feet of Jesus? And Judas said, why was this ointment not sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? And this he said, not that he cared for the poor. He didn't care two hoots about the poor. But because he was a thief and he had the bag and he bare what was put therein. Sometime I want to preach a sermon. I won't preach it in this crusade on why Jesus chose Judas. Judas was an apostle. He was a preacher. But covetousness led him to being a thief. And eventually G Judas sold Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. And the pretensions of Judas soon fell away. And God judges what's on the inside. But everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of the Father which is in heaven. Many times Judas had said, Lord, Lord, and worked for Jesus. Many times he had said, Lord, and he did it with such a holy expression. People didn't realize that deep in his heart, he'd given his heart to money and he was going to sell out Jesus. And how many of us are the same way? We'll sell him out for a mess of pottage. We'll sell him out for a little honor. We'll sell him out for a few extra dollars. Men sell their souls for money. Women's, women often sell their bodies. Many people rob God by not giving their tithes and offerings to the church. The ninth commandment, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Lying has become a way of life. Telling lies. Jesus said the devil was a liar from the beginning. The Antichrist is called in 2 Thessalonians, the lie. And I believe that democracy will dissolve into anarchy and violence and chaos unless we can reestablish truthfulness and integrity throughout the country. The Bible says... The Bible says all men are liars. Jesus said, I'm the truth. How many of you have ever told a lie? Everybody. I didn't mean for you to raise your hand. <laughs> Some of you are almost too honest. But we've all, at one time or another, we've either acted a lie or told a lie. And then the last commandment, thou shalt not covet. The rich young ruler asked, what must I do to have eternal life? And Jesus quoted several of the commandments, but you notice Jesus left out one. He left out the tenth one. Because you see, the rich young ruler said, I've kept all those commandments from my youth up. But Jesus put his finger on the very one he hadn't kept, thou shalt not covet, because his money came between him and God. And that's the reason Jesus said, I want you to give up your money and give it to the poor and then you can follow me. Jesus didn't want his money. It's not wrong to have money. The thing that's wrong is when our attitude toward it is so possessive that it becomes first in our lives above Jesus. God has given us so much in Christ that we need no longer make comparisons between ourselves and others with regard to possessions or talents or privileges or sufferings or whatever it may be so that we don't covet what the other person has. 
Now, every person in this audience has broken one of more of those commandments, haven't you? All right, why did God give the Ten Commandments when he knew in the beginning you couldn't keep them? You know why? The Bible says. He gave it to us as a mirror. He said the law is a mirror. You look in the mirror, and I read those Ten Commandments, and I say, well, I broke the first one, I broke the second one, I broke this one, I broke that one, I broke that one. And after a while, I begin to say, well, Lord, I'm a sinner. I'm in need of forgiveness because it says without forgiveness of these broken laws, I'm lost. So what does it do? The Bible says the law becomes a schoolmaster that drives me to Jesus Christ for forgiveness. It drives me to the cross. And I come to the cross and I say, Lord, I've broken the, your laws. I'm not holy. I'm not righteous. I'm sinful. I'm dressed well. I go to a good church or I lead a fairly decent life, but I'm guilty of breaking these laws of yours. I need forgiveness. I'm asking you tonight to come to the cross and say, Lord, I have sinned. I have broken your law. I want forgiveness. I want a new life that forgiveness can bring. I want to know that I'm going to heaven. I want to be sure that Christ is in my heart. You know, we make a number of different commitments in our lives, and that's true. But tonight you know that you need to take this step toward the cross and find forgiveness. And you know that you need Christ. That's all you need to know, is that I need him. You may not understand all about it, you may not be able to explain it all theologically, but you just know that you need him. And you come like a little child. And Jesus said, you can't come to him except you come like a little child. You come by faith. 